Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Uh, 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 uh. Competition starting to get thick, it's the click So I hope you watch your A-game, A-man No lames on the track when we unite and stick This is an A-game, better bring your A-game Competition starting to get thick, it's the click So I hope you watch your A-game, A-man No lames on the track when Sorry. Hey now, it's the Mike and JD show And I'm your host, Mike Gilbert And I'm joined as always by JD by God Oliva How you doing JD? Not as always. I believe I missed the show last week. So you, you did, you did. But that's I my did. that's my catch line. If I don't hit the line, I think people get freaked out. Well, that's fair. I felt yeah. uh, I felt like we were betraying people. We were, you yeah. know, far be it for me to break kayfabe, but you know, yeah. breaking kayfabe. Yeah, here. no. Uh, we had dude BQ was on last week, and we did probably from for our uh, just our YouTube specifically. Uh, it was our second like highest rated show we've ever done. Um, the most of oh. watch hours we've ever done. Great. And, Without me. Fantastic. Well, it, it was really because BQ came on and he had some TNA scoops that nobody else had. And uh, so that was really cool, man. He, uh, he, he, he actually did us a solid by not saving that for his own podcast. He dropped that shit here uh, with us. So uh, I was real, I was real happy and I'm real, uh, real thankful for BQ for doing that for us, man. We actually got a lot of subscribers over last week just because BQ just showed up. So, uh, thank you, BQ, sir. That was a great honor. But man, you've had an exciting couple of weeks, dude. Uh, Gaijin kicking ass. Gaijin doing pretty good. I got the the proof right here for Gaijin. It's, it's printed. It's done, kind of. So yeah, uh, we've launched the kicks. I launched the Kickstarter last Tuesday. So we have. Let me double check how many days I have left. I think twenty three. Uh, hard when you have the computers and yeah 22 actually 22 days left of the campaign to go and it's going solid man we are 20 we are 222 percent of the way funded um we're uh we're over halfway toward our first we're over three quarters of the way toward our first stretch goal we're about a little over halfway toward the final stretch goal so yeah man this is uh i didn't really got a chance to get into it on our show Right. This is uh, this is my new novel, Gaijin, which I think is uh, very appealing to people who listen to shows like this. It's a story of an American pro wrestler who kind of gets a second chance in Japan where uh, he inadvertently runs afoul of the Yakuza. Right. <laughs> he becomes a Yakuza enemy and inadvertently becomes a, a drug kingpin, like becoming, you know, he's 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 a uh, smuggling amphetamine into Japan, which is a big no, no. It's a country with very, very harsh drug laws. They, and they don't mess around in Japan. They when it comes do not. To that stuff. They do not mess around in Japan, which is a source of conflict and drama in the story. What makes this uh, book different than a typical thriller is that it's set, of course, in the world of Japanese pro wrestling. And it's set against the, the background of like a G1 style tournament, right, where our, our lead character he kind of he's hired on to be like the spoiler role in the tournament right and he's a villain and what i like about this story is it starts off with our main character his name's matt bradley he's a dude who's just in over his head and he's just trying to find his way and then slowly over time he becomes a complete and total piece of shit to the point where like he's <laughs> damn near or dim at the end meanwhile his character in the kayfabe because we do the kayfabe world right we play it off like it's legit um his character goes from being like this dastardly heel to becoming uh, a beloved baby face so the two characters kind of do a 180 on each other and uh I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with that. Sam, our friend, Sam Shipman from uh, power bombshells read it. And she texted me immediately after she finished the book. Like, how could you end this like this? How could you do this? <laughs> and I was just yeah. so proud. Cause I'm like, all right, yeah. I, I got it. It worked. My ending worked. I, I stuck the landing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That, that was really cool. What's cool about the Kickstarter is that, um, 
it's not only the book and not only you can you get the book but we also i did the program for the tournament mm. right so we have the brackets i'm going to put the brackets out on my kickstarter next week so you can actually see like how it shapes up you know it's a g1 style round robin tournament so i was able to create the brackets and little like I, I ripped off the official handbook of the marvel universe where i i did the entries for everybody you learn about their careers i had an artist like draw mock-ups of what they would look like so, I mean, it's really, it's a fun little thing. And you can, you can get this book in, in either ebook, paperback, hardcover, or audiobook, right? And then um, all my other books are able to at a discounted rate. So if you ever wanted to check out The World According to JD, the Kickstarter is the best place to do it. And I'm, I'm super thrilled with this. You read the book. You're one of the few people yes. that have actually read it. I got yeah. Mike to read a book. I'm super proud of myself <laughs> yeah. on that. The uh the last two books the the only two books since I've been out of school that I've read that were um that that are fiction were both written by J D Oliva uh, I read Gaijin and I also read uh, Deluge um, which also had a pretty bizarre and pretty badass ending so uh, I, I I really enjoyed it. I like how you weave the world of real life and kayfabe life um, I think you paint the picture beautifully I think it's awesome. Uh, how you the dichotomy of you know Matt Bradley uh, versus the Black Phoenix, like the different the differences between the real person and the character. Um, and I also like as a guy that lived in Japan and that once did almost run afoul of the Yakuza himself. I think I've told that story on Brace Room back, back. One of my the- favorites. Perhaps we should do that again someday. I yeah. like that one. Yeah, yeah that 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 was a that was a good story. I plan on going back to Japan before I end up getting out of the military. So I'm like, I don't know if I want to keep telling that story. They're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I I I, I just uh, you know love the book so much, and uh, Thanks, I man. I threw down and got myself an ebook. Even though it's an ebook, I want your digital signature on it somehow. We just need to do that. Like I can get a, <laughs> I, I can know. figure that out. I think I, I don't think know I how that works, but I I think I could. <laughs> I think I could figure that out. I'm pretty slick. I'm good yeah. at Photoshop. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this book. Dude. I think it's the best book I ever wrote. John Muse actually helped me book the tournament in the well, story. Yes. I mean, if you needed even more of a reason, John Muse is one of the co, you know, like helpers on the book. I don't want to call him a co-writer, but like a contributor to the book. Absolutely. When I was plot, when because I, I I was originally going to do this book with DC Comics uh, back in the day, like um, one of their editors kind of shepherded me and helped me put together the pitch for this thing, and then it just didn't work out. Like they kind of shuttered their Vertigo imprint, and I was one of the victims of that. So, uh, which is good, it wound up being my story, it wound up growing and changing with me, which is awesome. Um, when I was ready to do it, I, I texted John. I'm like, all right, man, we got to talk. Help me book a tournament because I don't. Yeah. I have an idea. I can I can write a book, but like writing wrestling is totally different. So I mean, mm-hmm. he really he really helped me put that together. He put in a lot of the twists of the tournament were his idea, and I'm like, ooh, that's that's good. So and I, it was really gave me an opportunity. When he told me that, it really gave me ideas of how I can parallel that in the book, right? So I mean, it was a it was John was a massive help on this. So this is a this is definitely definitely something I'm proud of, man. Like I said, it's the best book I've ever written, and a lot of our a lot of our good buddies in the chat have already jumped in and, and backed, and I, I can't thank them enough. And if you're listening to the show, man, I hope you I hope you can jump on. We got 22 days left of the campaign, and then ain't gonna be a whole lot of waiting because the thing is already done. Yeah, right. You just gotta. I'm just trying to make a big deal about putting the book out, and then you're gonna get it pretty quick. Cool, man. Uh, you also got something exciting happening on our Patreon. You uh, you released. You're going to be releasing bit by bit a short story that you just uh, you just wrote, and it is. Um, if you're into the Mike and JD show lore, uh, there is a pivotal character that really kind of brought us together. That it, that it, it has an idea in this book. Why don't you tell everybody about this? So I wrote. A, I'm writing another short story now. It's uh. My most of the stuff that I write is like supernatural thriller stuff behind me. You can see the cover the, the painted cover of my first book, Harvest Moon. And that's kind of my thing. But Bagaijin is totally like just a super, just a straight up, you know, gritty noir thriller. I, I titled this little short story, Killing the Town. I totally stole it from one Don Callis. <laughs> and uh, it's about <clears throat> it's about a character who shows up. It's from the it's in the 80s it's in wrestling territory in the 80s where uh a guy, you know, down on his luck. Yeah, it's another down on his luck guy. He gets an opportunity in basically Calgary, and they're doing one of those like they call them the Northern Death Tours. Your we chat where they're you know touring the native reserves up there, and the bus breaks down, and uh, they're trapped in the in the tundra with the Wendigo. So that's 
you know, one of my stories and I put the first chapter out there and uh, I'm going to just, you know, little by little, but I've never done it this way. I'm, I'm writing this book along with people. So you're going to get instant see like kind of how the process of making a book goes. So yeah, put a little bit out a little bit here and a little bit there on the, on the Patreon. Uh, I put a cool cover together. Pretty proud of that. So yeah, dude, that was an awesome cover. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed the artwork for it. So yeah, it's good stuff. If uh, you're a Patreon subscriber, if not, Hey, go to patreoncom slash the Mike and JD show. We, uh, we don't just crank out like wrestling podcasts. Uh, uh, we, we do, a, you know, some other kind of off the wall stuff. Uh, let me, let me get to the chat real quick. Uh, and then we'll get to the wrestling news. Yeah, King of the North says, I've heard this uh, Gaijin is a real true life story about JD himself. I wish I was that cool. Yeah. No, JD has never uh, smuggled a meth, nor has he ever ran into the Yakuza. I have ran into the Yakuza, and uh, they pulled a gun on a guy I know. So, <laughs> but everybody lives, so that's good news. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I decided to walk. I'll just tell the story. I decided to, uh, the, the Yakuza had this bar in uh, Fusa, which is right outside of Tokyo. And um, they were across from this bar called Eddie's Eddie's Bar, and uh, Eddie was this Japanese guy, but he's like very like into American culture, like always played American music. He had these black sunglasses on and this leather jacket, kind of a biker dude, and uh, he loved all the American military guys. <laughs> Sounds like Onita, actually. <laughs> uh, honestly, yes, uh, th that is a very good like. If I didn't know who Onita was back then when I lived there. But now that I know exactly that, that very much a good description, like a, a good comparator is Onita. Picture Onita, right, smoking a cigarette outside of a bar with some shades on, no matter what, like, whether it's day or night, brother's got some shades on and a leather jacket hanging outside of the bar and, and welcoming American military guys into his bar. But yeah, he ran that bar that we'd always go to. And then right across the street was a Yakuza bar. And they always told us to stay away from there. But uh, one day I was like, you know, I, I just thought that they would like me. Which is t typically like that's how I get in trouble. It's like I assume that people like me when they really don't, and uh, like I just like you know I'm a charming motherfucker. Let me just walk over there and sweet talk them so I can go check out their bar. And they were like you know pretty upset at me and uh, told me to get the hell out of there. I did not do like the Aki Bono thing where I cussed at them. That that did not happen. But uh, another guy that I was with decided to you know not be so nice. And uh, like later in the evening, I guess they caught him outside and they chased him off and shot at him. But he was a uh, he ended up being okay. <laughs> so, yeah. My favorite, my favorite Mike Gilbert stories involve you assuming everybody loves you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like, well, it's like me being shit faced and it's like, you know what? These people love me. Like why, you know, why, uh, you know, why don't I just go over there and, uh, and because they, they naturally would want to be my friend, but uh, of course they did not, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I don't drink and uh, that, you know, almost, uh, almost getting shot up by the Yakuza would be one of those reasons. Yeah. Definitely in the list. I love the fact that you just assume everybody loves you, and I just assume people hate me and go on and go <laughs> yeah. off that assumption and move from there. Yeah. So, oh man. Yeah. Uh, DJ Convoy, a uh, friend of the show, day one friend of the show, Patreon yeah. subscriber, said he enjoyed part one of Killing the Town thank very you. much. So, thank you. And uh, uh, Gerard, big new distribution deal. Gerard, he is in the chat. Uh, he is holding out hope for that TNA deal. One day, Gerard, one day. And then. Maybe. Uh, Dan Goucher, uh, Mike Tazawa, good evening. Oh, uh, yeah, you got your headband on. Oh, Mike I got Tazawa. my headband on. I don't, yeah, yeah. I, it's become such a part of me again that I don't even think about not wearing it anymore. I've worn it every day for two months. Not the same <laughs> yeah. headband, just a headband. Yeah. Hey, so, where I want to get started with the, uh, you know, the wrestling news uh, tonight is, you know, I, I watched Dynamite this morning. I was able to, to, to finish it this morning. I caught a little bit last night and then I got up early this morning and finished it. Man, I thought it was a much better show than I've seen probably the last month. Oh yeah, like, I know, I know, I know. A few weeks ago, whenever um, they had that gauntlet match, that was probably the best match I had seen on television in years. But I felt like the overall show wasn't that great. But that match specifically was pretty Agreed. awesome. I thought last night, aside from a couple of segments that were pretty cringe, I for the most part, I I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a hell of a show. I really liked the uh, the segment between Will Ospreay. And um, b between Will Ospreay and Swerve, sorry, my, my, my light decided to fall. Will Ospreay and uh, Swerve. I, I, th I thought that was fantastic. Um, just a really fun show, man. A AEW needed a, a week like this, and I think they got it. No, I agree. I think it's the best dynamite they've had in months, like top to bottom. It wasn't perfect by 2024 standards. One of the better dynamites of the year, to be quite yeah. frank. Yeah. DJ yeah. Convoy is his best one in ages. I agree. And I was, we have a group there with Muse and uh, I was texting during the group, during the, the Osprey 
uh, Swerve segment. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. Osprey's promo here is just unreal. Dude. And then yeah. Swerve just, like, I know our boss Joe Lanza and his review said is the best Swerve promo ever. I I can't argue I, with that one. Bit. I don't I don't disagree with that because I've been watching Swerve since he was on Lucha Underground and MLW, mm-hmm, and I've never seen him that good before. And he and I've been a big fan of his for years, but mm-hmm. I, that was the best promo I've ever seen him do. Absolutely, dude. The line of the night was while you were in hit row, I had a hit list. <laughs> I, was, I was like, no, that's why wrestling. Now that's what. And again, yeah. I got between that and the MJF Roosh match, which some people didn't love it. I thought it was great. Yeah. I just. I love the intensity of those two. Like both those guys are so freaking intense that I I want more of it. And based on the fact that we saw the aforementioned Don Callis with Roosh later in the show, leads me to believe they're going to keep doing some of them. I just, man, I loved it. I kept, I was like, this is what I want from wrestling. Like this felt like the more we can lean away from, again, they lean two into WWE points, but the more they can lean away from it and do their own thing, the better off they are just constantly like that promo segment. It was just two dudes talking. And I feel like there's real stakes now. And Swerve, yeah. I know Swerve's a baby face now, but he's so good at being a prick. You know? Yeah. He's just so good at like, oh, say hi to Harry for me. Like, that's his yeah. kid, man. Oh, vicious. <laughs> well, that, vicious. that is that is very much like gamesmanship, like a guy just trying to one up his opponent and get into his head. Part of, I don't even see that as being like a heel move. That is just like you would see that in MMA. Like that, that 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 that's like a boxing thing to do just to just to get into your opponent's head a little bit and that's what like the now now the match has a big fight feel mm-hmm. when i did not feel like it did before no, that doesn't mean i wasn't interested in it i was but it's like you know baby face baby face match you know you know what i mean it's like okay two mm-hmm. guys going out there kicking out of shit should be fun but who really cares now i care because there's a little bit of a personal issue i found it to be refreshing i this is exactly what i want pro wrestling to be when i envision it it's yes. two bad motherfuckers um, that don't like each other and they're fighting for a cause. And that cause is the world heavyweight championship. And now you added the, the added stipulation that now Will Ospreay wants to take that belt into Wembley as the world heavyweight champion. Now you got a second cause on top of that. I found it to be beautiful. We talk about story in wrestling a lot. I, I go off on this, right? What is a story? People go, they don't tell stories. I don't tell stories. A story is you have a character, a protagonist who has a goal. Something is standing in the way of his goal. That is the story, the journey toward the goal. And we have that. We have two protagonists. Will Ospreay wants to be the champion going into his home country. Swerve wants to prove that he is not a fluke and he is the champion. Boom. You've got these two trains colliding into each other. And now you have the make the basis for what can be a really good story. Now everything that happens in there is the beats, right? The story beats is where is where things get strong, where they fall apart, right? It's all about the beats on the way, but the story itself is there. The nuts and bolts are there. And what I love is we didn't need the mystical murder rabbit to get us there. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and uh, with WWE kind of going hard into the other direction, which we thought for a long time they're getting away from. Now they've just steered back into it with the Wyatt six. And, and look, if you're a Wyatt six, fit, like have fun, right? In, enjoy it. What I like is what Will Ospreay and Swerve did. What I like is MJF versus Roosh. If you like, you know, what, what Bo Dallas and those cats were doing hey, more power to you. Enjoy yourself. I just not, not exactly for me. Uh, I don't, I don't completely hate it. Like I, I like some hokey shit in wrestling sometimes. If it makes me laugh, I'm good with it. If I don't have to take it, if I, but if you're making me take it seriously, not really my cup of tea, but um, they need to completely steer totally away from it. And uh, I felt like they, they did that with that segment, but Dan Goucher has a, a good comment in here. And I, I think is actually, he's, he's right. So the contract signings, so he's talking about Mina Shirakawa and mm-hmm. uh, Tony Storm was, every WWE contract. Well, it's been every contract signing in pro wrestling for 50 years. Mm-hmm. Um, the WWE didn't start it. They just kind of popularized it. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I lasted about three minutes of that contract signing and I just fast forwarded because I was watching on delay. So, but people like that go for it. I'm a Mina Shirakawa fan, sir. So I was watching that segment. Um, I had, okay. So when it comes to the contract, I think that, I don't hate the idea of a contract signing. I think it can be cool. I like the idea behind it. I just think they need to do it differently. 
like what I would like to see is I like to see a contract signing done. Maybe, maybe at event, maybe like in the city where it's going to be, give me some live yeah. shots there, have them fight like on a dais right in front of a, like at a press conference, do something at a, at a like have it sign at like a baseball game or something like that. Do it. Like take it out of the ring, do something different with it. Right. Make it yeah. interesting. Just don't, I mean, we got Peppermint in there, so she's going to lean into everything Vince taught her. Right, and we got Jimmy Jacobs there. He's going to do things that are just stupid because he has no R- real vision. R.D. Evans is now there. R.D. Evans is now there. Yeah. Like you got guys who aren't original thinkers. So I mean, the more you can challenge people by having original thinkers in there, I don't hate the. I didn't hate the concept. I don't hate the concept of the contract signing on its own. What I hate is that it's so tropey, right? Yeah. And I don't think I think you have to challenge tropes. I think at some point someone has to say, "Is this different?" And then go off and like, and if the answer is no, then think, really think about whether or not you need that segment, right? Could they have done that segment differently? Yes. Could they have, if they'd have done it on the stage, as opposed to in the ring, it would have been different in and of itself. I think you can do these things. You just have to challenge yourself and do them in a different place and do them where someone doesn't go through the table, right? Yes. How many times do we see a contract setting where someone goes through a table every fucking time? Like, yep challenge yourself man be different so as good a dynamite as this was we still lean too heavy into tropiness right challenge trope i'll tell you something this is a take i haven't seen anywhere this is my take one thing that i have always hated in wrestling is the invisible cameraman right where you have two dudes that are having a conversation and there just happens to be a cameraman there tna always motivated it by having like the spy cameraman like they shot it like reality tv where like the cameraman's kind of like spying on what, one of one of Bischoff's only good ideas in TNA. By the way, I agree. I agree. That I agree that Eric Eric's stupid. He doesn't have all bad ideas, but TNA still does that. At least they were doing last time. So I watched TNA. Yeah. But they still have that. So, but WWE always has the the mysterious floating camera guy who we have to pretend isn't there. Samoa Joe and Hook had a similar segment where they were going to see the the premier athletes. I can't remember what Mark Stone's crew is called, and it was very much that segment until you realize Shibata was working the camera. And then I went, oh shit, we spun the trope. Yeah, We challenged the trope. We had it. It was a very tropey segment until it wasn't. Just by hearing, you didn't have to see Shibata. You just, they motivated that, that voice, right? That Siri voice is him. That's how Shibata cuts promos. So just hearing that, even if he wasn't in the building, they as a view, they have told you as a viewer that Shibata was the cameraman. Now we've taken a WWE segment challenged it and done it something new with it that was actually one of my favorite segments because it was different what are the chances that shibata wasn't even there i and 50 50 yeah yeah like i think it's a real possibility that he just wasn't there but that was their way of including Uh him into the segment even though he wasn't there did they tape collision tonight did i see that i think okay yeah. yeah so maybe maybe he just wasn't in town yet like or maybe he was on to the next town but um, but th- I think they're doing that match to they did that match to the tapings tonight. I think if all you're going to do is have his voice, you don't have to fly him in, save yourself a hundred bucks on a plane ticket and let Shibata hang out with his family at home. Like, and again, they motivated it. They motivated the invisible cameraman. I can't tell you how much I appreciated a little thing like that. Like I have a hunch that was Will Washington. Cause that had outsider thinking written all over it. And I just, yeah. one of my favorite things on the show last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kudos to them. Kudos to them. I, I, I really dig it. Um, but so one of the other things I wanted to get, uh, actually, Io has a good comment in here, and I wanted to get your thoughts. Just want to respect Jeff Jarrett. If he wants to be in the Owen Cup to honor No Biggie, that's what his, that was his best friend. So there are people shitting on the idea of the fact that Jeff Jarrett's in the Owen Cup because he is not a contender for the title. So in sports context, I get that. However. The only guy in that company specifically that has a legitimate connection to Owen Hart next, the, and you know, Christian Cage and Edge do too, or Adam Copeland, sorry, but because the very Jarrett. last match in Owen Hart's career was Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett versus Edge and Christian. Uh, right, that was the night before he died. So, I but Owen, but Jarrett has a connection to Owen, it makes perfect sense that he's in the tournament. Um, could could there have been other bigger name stars? Of course, but this is what they did. Uh, but I love the fact that Jarrett's included. No, I think it had to happen. Like, um, I, if you're under the, I hate, I'm sorry. If you're under the age of 25 and have no perception of, of pro wrestling history, I don't, I don't listen to your opinion. I just yeah. don't. Cause you can't understand that. Like if you were not a fan in 1999, 25 years ago when Owen Hart died, 
like we're coming we just passed the 25th anniversary right and watching the most un- one of the most uncomfortable episodes of raw ever where you have all these people battling trauma and you're forcing them to be on tv and cut live promos jeff jarrett's was the I'm, i'll never forget how hard it was to watch jeff jarrett's promo yeah and how much pain he was in having watched his best friend die before before him you know yeah. so if if and i think this is one of the most brilliant thing tony's ever done is you put jeff in the tournament he's against the wild card so he doesn't have to win right he can just go and and represent that and he's jeff jarrett so he's going to memphis the shit out of it and it'll be entertaining for a segment yeah. and it's it's great to be honest yeah. with you. it's absolutely great and if you don't appreciate history of pro wrestling i don't take you seriously yeah you know say, same here i i Look, you can say whatever you want about Jeff Jarrett's wrestling ability. The guy's in his 50s, um, and all his matches typically end up being the same way. But I, you know what? He's entertaining to me. I I find him to be a refreshing performer in this day and age because what he does is so much different than what everybody else is doing. I, mm-hmm. I really dig what Jeff Jarrett's doing right now. Um, and, but I'll, and I'll be honest, in the mid-2000s, I was not digging what Jeff Jarrett was doing. I did well... not like Jeff Jarrett. I did not like Jeff Jarrett as the TNA yeah. champion. I just, I didn't. Because it was bad. It was yeah, not he, good. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it wasn't good, but I like what he's doing right now. And also, like, I, you know, I, I am a fan of Jarrett's podcast. That's the only podcast with Conrad I can listen to now is the Jarrett one because I, I feel like Jarrett tells the truth, uh, which is a difficult thing to do when you're on that you're on the ad-free show network. And the objective is to lie. Mm-hmm. And the objective is to create grifting opinions that you don't really have in order to get clicks and ad revenue and subscriptions. Well, Jeff Jarrett, because of his sobriety, and I have that in common with him, he doesn't have that in him, so he doesn't do it. Even though at times Conrad tries to push him in that direction, you can tell that he just doesn't want to go in that direction. So, well, on his podcast, he said that he had PTSD because of that. And I, and I totally get it. I, I understand it. Uh, I, I I completely get it. So if this is a healing moment for him, uh, more more power to him, and uh, you know, uh, God bless you, Tony Gone for doing that. Um, so what do you think about the rest of the the tournament bracket, man? It's okay. I mean, like I know people had like higher aspirations of it, and unfortunately, a lot of these Owens never quite are as good as we hoped. I mean, you have Daniel, Bri- I'm Daniel Brian, Jesus Christ. You have Brian Danielson and Shingo Tagaki in the first round. I thought that's pretty cool. Pac and Claudio, that was a really good match last night. Like, um. It's it's fine. I wish these were bigger. I wish these were 16 man brackets instead of eight man brackets. I think you could have some freedom to do some more stuff. I saw like not to pick on Zach Hadorn, but he was like real upset that like Moxley's on a term. I'm like, well, Moxley's the IWGP champion right now, man. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of he's kind of busy. He was like, what about Osprey? I said, Osprey's got the shot. Why is yeah. he in a tournament for a shot at the title when he's already got the shot of the title? What sense does that make? I mean, Okada yeah. would have been. It would have been fine if Okada was. Oh, yeah, o- Okada, Okada, and I think Okada and Joe probably should have been in the tournament. That would yeah, make it. I, and M- and MJF as well. Okay, um, MJF hasn't been in the company for six months. He had his first match last night, so I but, can I can get on board with not using him in a sports sense. Well, but he's still the former world former champion. champion. I'm with you yeah. on that, but I mean, yeah, I, if they would have added him, uh, I I think that you know just star power alone would would have would have added an element. But I'm looking at the brackets. And it's very much like these guys are all going to have really good matches. You know what I yeah. mean? And I, I think it's very much designed for Brian Danielson to get the victory and then head to all in like kind of not his swan song. Cause I do think he's going to be there for the Tacoma dome show coming up later this year, but it's probably going to be his last opportunity at the AEW world championship as he heads off into the sunset for a while. Do you have him win it? I, I I have Brian Danielson winning it. Yeah, who who yeah. else could win it? No, I mean, okay, none of that's what I meant. Let's say Brian wins the Owen, right? And he gets yeah. the shot at all in. Do you have him win it? Do you have Brian win the title? If you if you have him win the title and he agrees to drop it back to Swerve in Tacoma, yeah. I think that's what you do too. Yeah. I I, I and I think that makes Swerve a bigger star. I do too. Yeah. And I and I think it elevates that title to to be even more important because you have one of the greatest wrestlers of all time on your list of world champions. I, I think that means something. And so mm-hmm. I and I don't think losing to Danielson at Wembley hurts Swerve's momentum. Um, I, I think that he's going to go in and kill it with Will Ospreay coming up. I see him winning that match um, and then heading into All In. I, I think yeah, if Danielson sticks around a little bit longer and he's willing to put over Swerve and Tacoma, I think that's the move. 
Yeah, I, I think that's the most interesting you, you can do right now because I do think you could have a moment with Danielson winning in Wembley, right? Um, I think Danielson could be a nice draw with yeah. Gabe making sure you get asses in the seats in Wembley, which it's not a big problem yet, but I mean, like, it, it, there's I think they're tapped out at 40 right now, so you're yeah. like 40 ish, so you need to like you need to get another 30,000 people in that arena. Right. So yeah. I think having Brian Danielson's last hurrah or Brian Danielson's last triumphant run at the title and having him win in front of that crowd would do something. And then in Washington, both their home States, you having Danielson pass a torch to sort of say to swerve, I think would be a great thing. That's what I, if I'm booking, which I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean that, I think that's the smart money. And then I do like I do like the idea of uh, Will Osprey and MJF in the co-main position um, there. I mean, you could even have them headlining if you wanted to. Uh, I you know you can have one open the show and the other one headlining if you wanted. But I do like that matchup, and they teased it last night on Dynamite. So here's the thing, though. So we got set up. Yeah, exactly. We got the setup in Dynamite. I think uh, I think Osprey MJF is probably your your. Uh your B match. You're not seeing a B match, but your one A match for yeah. the show. Cause that's the other big match the company can offer right now. And then, you know, you can set stuff up for the future. I think that um, we still got some good matches possibility in this company. We haven't seen yet. I mean, like the, the talent in this company is, is an embarrassment of riches. We just need to uh, get things moving. I think story wise, most of the undercard stuff really doesn't matter all that much, but I mean, I think for main event stuff, I think we're moving in a good position in the company. Yeah, because I, I felt like Swerve was a bit cold after he won that title, you know? Um, and I didn't think that Christian Cage was a good first opponent, but uh, they were able to heat it. I, I'm going to get to the comment. Don't worry about it. I, so I didn't, yeah, I, I I didn't think I didn't think that Christian Cage was a good first opponent, but they ended up making me interested in the feud heading into the match. Um, and I think coming out of it, Swerve has been, um, has looked like a much bigger star. And I felt like his promo this week on Dynamite has been really helpful to him. And so, and then getting a win over Osprey at Forbidden Door um, would be awesome. And then now Osprey, you know, has a setback and he sets his sights on Wembley next year. Now, I don't know that there's going to be a Wembley next year. He might have his sights set on Wembley Arena next year, not Wembley Stadium. It's Tony, if, uh, gonna Tony Khan. To, Tony he, Khan he is going to want to. Tony Khan is going to want to put people in that seat in Wembley to yeah. prove himself. And billionaire. If there's one thing I'd say about billionaires, it's that they will swing their wang until they prove that they know better than you. So I think yeah. you got. One, I think we got at least one more year at Wembley Stadium, yeah. not Wembley Arena. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree. Now let me let me get to this uh Please. God Please. Illa. First he says, support Gaijin. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate sir. you. And then he goes, uh, JD and Mike looking like they're in a gender <laughs> reveal rooms. <laughs> it, you know it's funny it too is Mike's got a daughter and I have a son, so it kind of it kind of works perfect. It it does, but I have a son on the way and I'm actually That's in true. his nursery, but I <laughs> use the the pinkish light because my daughter picked it <laughs> she she liked that color the best and i feel like it offsets jd mm -hmm. and i have the the we have the red background so i was like oh, i don't want to go red because i'll blend too much into the background so i swish it up it's like kind of a pinkish magenta Dude, is it, what plays, we're doing. it plays perfectly off each other but Ella's <laughs> comment had to be uh, yeah it had was, to be uh, read out loud i do almost I like hate, dj saying I hate conrad credit, and his though. circle of yeah me too uh, I like the con uh, DJ Convoy's got a nice little comment. Ha ha ca Conrad and his circus of dorks. I agree yeah. with that. I, anytime you can, I, I tweeted out something the other day. It was a little controversial. I said, Conrad has done some real damage to wrestling fandom and feeding into the mm -hmm. tribalism and the idiots. And I, I kind of stand by that. Yeah. I no. You know what? I think that's a good segue. I, I happen to completely agree with you. And, and this is coming from a guy that was a fan of Conrad early on. Me too. I like, I liked the show with Bruce Pritchard. Uh, in fact, the very first thing I ever did on a podcast was interview Conrad Thompson. Um, I, he was on the, the Wrestling Observer message board, and I, he and I became friendly because I was a frequent commenter in the, the Something to Wrestle With um, thread in there. And he would comment in there all the time. I DM'd him one time, said, hey, I have, I've been doing podcasting for a while. I had not. Uh, and, and I, uh, I, I was like, I'd love to have you on my show, man. It's uh, you know, kind of a throw. I just invented a show. And then uh, he was gracious enough to call me and we did like an hour together. 
Wow. And he, he didn't know me from Adam and I didn't even have a real podcast. I made the whole thing up, but then I was able to put it on a show and I created my, my first podcast, the podcast express because of that interview. So, um, that, you know, that, that was really cool of him to do, but he, he absolutely feeds into the negativity because he, he doesn't care. It makes him money. Mm-hmm. He likes to, he likes to, the tribalism because he can profit off of it. And he likes to try to discredit Dave Meltzer, but then he's like, Oh, Oh, I, I'm a long time subscriber. I don't have anything against Dave. And then, but here, what do you think about this? And he's lining them up and setting them up to go ahead and try to do this big takedown. When in reality, before Bischoff got that podcast, 83 weeks, him and Dave were friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he w- used to do Dave's show. They talked all the time. In fact, you know, John Muse came here and told the story, but d- he reached out to Dave to get advice on creative. And then that's how John Muse got connected with Eric Bischoff to, to go and work for the WCW relaunch. The mm-hmm. fact of the matter is, is the, the, here's the reason why I call Eric Bischoff a grifter. People are like, you're using that out of context. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Because a grifter, right? It's like people say, well, grifters are guys that you, they say they're giving you one thing, but they're, they're not and they're ripping you off. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what he's doing because he's creating fake opinions to be able to get you guys to trigger you guys to have an emotion so that way you will consume. You'll consume the product. You'll click the links. You'll subscribe. You'll pay for the like he's he's full of shit and you guys are falling for it. So he, he absolutely is a grifter. Conrad's a grifter. He comes out here and he acts like that's why guys like us listened to him back in 2016 when his podcast launched. He acted like one of us. Well, golly, golly gee, I'm a wrestling observer subscriber and I've been a wrestling fan for this long. And I'm just I'm just a humble old southern boy who who likes his wrestling. And he's a fucking millionaire. Yeah. Right. And his whole his whole podcast empire is just a grift to get people to buy mortgages. Yes. That's all it is. It almost worked on me. I almost, I almost, because they said they can get you the lowest interest rate. So I called him before, uh, before I bought my last house, I didn't end up going with him, um, uh, because he did not actually get me a lower interest rate. And in fact, because I'm in California, they didn't, they didn't service California. They were going to, um, basically connect me with somebody that would, and they would get a cut of the money. I was like, well, no, I'll just go with the person my realtor wanted me to go with in the first place. So I did that. So, but I did call them. I, I almost, almost got a mortgage from Conrad. When he got that interview with Jim Crockett Jr. before he died, I'm like, I have to hear this. I'm a, I'm a yeah. student of history. It was thirty fucking dollars to listen to a, an interview with an old man who's almost senile. Like, did you ever, like, did you ever end up hearing it? No, I'm a cheap oh, ass. I wasn't gonna I'll, pay thirty dollars. I'll send it see, to you. That's why. See, that's why I like my. <laughs> see, that, you know, I should have just came to you in the first place. Why didn't you just ask? You know, I got I it. I'll just I know. I didn't, drive, baby. I, didn't, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I should have because we had a podcast at the time. Like, yeah, I don't know why I didn't think about it. But yeah, like, that's the thing, though, is he's just, he is the king grifter because he acts like yeah. us. Well, I'm just like, you guys, I'm a fan. And then it's just, you feed the negative, you feed the negativity. Like, if you ever want to see the biggest truck, and I've, I've just gotten to the point where, like, I'm so fed up with Twitter, like the idiots on Twitter. I just, I'm calling them out like you're a fucking dork. Like coach, the coach was out there doing, Jonathan Coachman was tweeting stupid shit. Like this guy works for the PFL and he's going to talk about AEW crowds. <laughs> So I'm just like, all right, you're a fucking dork. And Bix retweeted that. So I was like, I'm like, oh, good. That just expanded my reach with Bix yeah. retweeting me calling Coachman a dork. That made me happy. So I'm just going to keep doing it. Like, and if you look at Dave's tweets, like you just see the biggest troglodytes in, on the internet, right? And they're all so many. If they're over the age of, if they're under 30, they just have Roman Reigns avatars. If they're over 40, they all listen to ad free shows and Jim Cornette. And at least with yeah. Jim Cornette, it's not a grift. That's him. Like, yeah, I, I, I 100% believe that Jim Cornette is not creating fake opinions to get over. I think he's defending his fake, his real opinions so much so that he was willing to lose a lot of friends, which is what mm-hmm. happened, mm-hmm. but he, he, he wasn't doing it. I feel like Bruce Pritchard and Eric Bischoff specifically created characters for a podcast because they were conned into it by Conrad because Hey, if you just trash Dave Meltzer and you trash AEW, well, it's with Bischoff specifically, if you trash AEW, we could actually, that's what the algorithm likes. And mm-hmm. you and I both know that for a fact because our shows where we were pretty tough on AEW and I put on the Tony Khan face thumbnail, they do, they do better mm-hmm. than, than our normal, like tonight, tonight's episode is us praising AEW. I know for a fact, it's not going to do as good in the YouTube clips mm-hmm. as it would if we came on and trashed them. I but I'm not going to come on here and give a fake opinion because I know, because it'll make us money. I'm just not willing to do that. Neither, neither are you. 
Well, we got ourselves into some trouble with some of the the VOW fan base because like they can we'll, kiss we'll, my whole ass. I know. Well, we'll fuck care. with like we'll fuck with the <laughs> algorithm. And Joe even Joe defended yeah. us. Joe's like it's a bit yeah. that they do. And I'm like, because it is. And I we talked about it beforehand. And like the the proof is in the pudding. When we do yeah. that, our numbers are a lot better. When we're hard on AEW, people love that shit because there's nothing people love more than to defend the rape factory. Like they just they eat it up. They love it. Oh my god, the mystical murder rabbits back. Oh my lord, the dumbest uh, people are going to say the the stupidest things for the next six months about why this is genius. The fetophiles. God, I got to remember that one. <laughs> it, we have a that, collection. We and that's from the Voices of Wrestling Discord. I wish I could remember who said it first. Good one. But I just want to like join the Voices of Wrestling Discord. You hear some comedy gold in there, and sometimes I'll steal that gold and say it on this podcast. But it came from the Discord. Please, if somebody knows who said it first, let me know. I'd like to give them but, credit. We have a collection here of people who have never even been mid card and never really been over, but now they're going to wear these dumb fucking masks, and all of a sudden, this is genius. It's so brilliant. They shot Chad Gable in the head. Oh my God. We have redefined wrestling. Like the way people bend and twist themselves out of shape to defend the dumbest fucking shit. And when WWE was doing this shit, it's when their audiences dwindled the most. Remember when they had Seth Rollins screaming and crying when the magical murder clown was going to get him? They ended a pay-per-view like that and it did terrible. And they weren't selling any tickets, but people, yeah. I know Bray Wyatt's gone and it's really sad. It really is. Like, it's a tragic thing that that, yeah. that poor guy died. I really think so. But he had terrible ideas. He had terrible his, his ideas. Early, his early stuff was awesome. I thought the cult yeah, leader yeah, was the cult great, leader stuff, but, but then he went into the supernatural spooky. And I don't, I, unless you're playing it for like comedy. Cause I know the house Hardy stuff early on did some of that stuff. And I thought it was comedy. pretty funny, it's comedy. but that, yeah, but you know, with Bray Wyatt, it was like you're supposed to like legitimately be scared of that, and it just mm -hmm. wasn't working because pro wrestlers are not good actors. No, and it's also well. Here's the thing, too. Like pro wrestling is really good at doing pro wrestling. Yeah. Nothing can do pro wrestling better than pro wrestling, except for Gaijin, available now on Kickstarter. Like, <laughs> there's nothing like pro wrestling's great at that. Like, if I want to get scared, I'm gonna go watch a horror movie. I just finished the new Stephen King book. There's some stuff in there that's pretty scary. No, Bray, uh, not Bray, Bray's gone. Bo Dallas wearing a stupid Barry Windham mask is not scary. Alexa Bliss, remember when they were doing that whole thing with him and her and Bray and it was like knocking on the door of some weird little, like, you know. Uh... Knocking on the door? I called it out specifically. Yeah. Like that was, you know, very much. I was some, you know, I heard Drake's into that stuff, apparently from Kendrick Lamar. I couldn't think of a good way to say it. And you just nailed it home right there. I didn't want to say the word. If, that was going If you guys, a, hey, if you, if you guys have not seen Kendrick Lamar's concert on Amazon prime last night, uh, Drake has to fake his own death now at this point. Like there is no coming back from it. The entire city of LA hates that motherfucker. <laughs> It's and awesome. I and I couldn't be and I couldn't love them more for it. But go hilarious. ahead. Sorry. It's, no, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but I mean, why do I want to watch that stuff? Which did not draw. Yeah, they sold some merchandise. Yeah, but it didn't sell tickets. It wasn't the pay per views weren't as like doing as well. Like the company wasn't as strong as it is now. So why are you steering back into it with a bunch of people who've never been over? Oh my God, that's Nikki Cross. Oh my God, Nikki Cross has never been over. Yeah. Oh my God, that's Joe Gacy. Oh my God, Joe Gacy is a CZW reject. Like, who cares? Why do people care about this stuff? I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't get it either. But I, yeah, I'm very much a guy that's like, like what you like. If you enjoy it, have fun, man. No, to, no, you're to, you're wrong. I no, no, I'm just like, if that if that's what you enjoy, go go have fun. I I I, I really don't care. But I am not gonna watch it. <laughs> just it just it just isn't for me. Like, and they would really it would really take a lot for them to win me over. I like cool masks and wrestling. I just happen to be a fan of masks. Oh, like yeah. masks are you cool. know what I mean? So if they're gonna yeah. do that, like if they're if Eric Rowan and Joe Gacy are gonna come out and just be bad motherfuckers, okay. Let like let let me see it. And are are the matches good and are the promos good? That's all I really care. That's all I really care about. I don't really care about like this other stuff with them murdering people backstage and the blood and all, all that like I'm I'm not I'm not really I'm not really into it. And there's a context for everything because if they did that same thing in Lucha Underground, I'd probably dig it. Lucha I like Underground was different. And that was Lucha that was a different was different. thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I I happened to like the I, I was a big fan of the Hardy stuff in 2016. I, you know what? But that was that was TNA. That was a different thing. They were doing mm -hmm. it outside of the building. It was a different context. It was you know whatever, and it was a kind of a fun thing that that set TNA apart. 
I just, I, the Wyatt stuff never really appealed to me outside of the original incarnation of the, the, the original three with Eric Rowan, um, um, sorry, Luke Harper. I wanted to say his WWE name and, uh, and Bray Wyatt uh, outside of that. I just have not been a fan of anything that, that is it that has ever come out of it. Are you telling me you didn't like when Randy Orton had to like be scared of like the digitally projected worms on the ring? No. Or when they went and wrestled in a haunted house. Oh God. Why yeah. are we? Why are people nostalgic for this stuff? It was so bad. It was. I can so tell you bad. why, JD, and we and you and I and John talked about it earlier this week because of merch. Yeah. It's 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 a ploy to sell toys and T-shirts, and they're gonna sell a ton of toys and T-shirts, mm -hmm. but they might they might do that at the risk of losing some of their television and their ticket buying audience because once those guys get in the ring, here's the here's the thing that people don't want to discuss: they can't go. Yeah, I could. saw Eric Rowan have a couple of good matches in some trios uh, in AEW, and I saw him have a couple good matches with the Wyatt family. But for the most part, man can't go. Bo Dallas, he had a, he had a good ladder match back in the day in NXT. Can't go. As a Nikki Cross, Nikki Cross. Sorry, she she at one point she seemed like she was going to be an up and coming talent. Figured out couldn't go. Dexter Loomis, Sam Shaw, Sam Shaw never could go. The guy could guy, guy can't wrestle. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and Joe Gacy, I've literally never seen a Joe Gacy match. So I can't tell you if you can go or not. No one cares. Like yeah. I just, and here's what bothers me is everybody bends over so backwards to praise what's going on. WD right now, whether it's good or not, it's just because it's on WWE TV, it's awesome. And what bothers me is that TNA has like sacrificed its own stuff. For W for NX for bad NXT television. What they did to Joe Hendry, like you got a guy legitimately over in Joe Hendry with your audience. And you taking a guy who should have been a digital media act, and mm -hmm. he should be the champion right now. And they bushwhacker looked him. I could dude, I I couldn't believe it. I I legitimately could not believe what happened to Joe Hendry on Wednesday. And I, I came on Brace for Impact over the weekend, and I basically predicted that Joe Hendry would be in that battle royal. They they were teasing it for a while, so it wasn't like a big surprise. He wasn't advertised, but I assumed that he would be there. And I was like, ah, you know what? He'll probably come in. He'll have a great entrance. The people go crazy, which they did. That entrance was insane. <laughs> The, the crowd was awesome. The camera was shaking. The building was shaking. They sang along with his song. <laughs> TNA is very over to the NXT audience, believe it or not. They really are. It and NXT is not over to the TNA audience because when Tatum Paxley came out for her match with Jordan Grace, it was utter crickets and Jordan Grace beat her in ten minutes. And it actually was a decent match. I, I think that Tatum yeah. Paxley might might have some talent. So that I I, I, I think I Jordan thought, carry can carry people because she's a talent. But I, I I've seen Jordan struggle with people that aren't that good before. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not gonna say Tatum's completely a bad wrestler. That was the only match I've ever seen her in. To be honest with you, I, I like before the match happened, you and I were discussing whether or not she was an actual person. Mm -hmm. She is a real person, um, and she happened to have a decent match with Jordan Grace. But anyway, he comes out, and I get a text. Like I, I'm at work, and I get a text, and it's like, oh shit, Joe Henry's on NXT. I was like, oh cool, I'll check it out later. And then I get a text two minutes later. They fucking eliminated him. And then I got another text. I can't believe what they just did to Joe Henry. And I'm like, what, what did they do? And they go, he he entered. Everybody jumped him. And the Kazarian dumped him out. I was like, you're kidding me. There's no way they're that stupid. But yes, they are. And and I know everybody wants to put that put that heat on NXT, who has some pretty awful booking. But I, I, I don't want to absolve TNA from this because I feel like they're a part of that. Because they have to okay that shit. And well, so the, both of them together made a really bad decision. Because And everybody's like, oh, Mike, he's not completely dead yet. He, he His career is not over yet. He's not dead yet. It doesn't matter if they can rebuild him. They should not have to rebuild him. He should gotta, stay strong. He is their top baby face and or organic baby face that they didn't have to buy from another fucking company. It's like remember, the first one that they've ever had a homegrown star in a long time. And what did they do? They geeked him out in a minute. In front of the biggest audience he's ever been in front of. It is disgusting. You want to talk about defining someone down upon the first time. Like, cause you're right. He, I watched it. I saw it when I heard it, I had to put it on. Cause I'm like, Oh shit, Joe Henry on TNXT. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah. And then I saw what they did. I'm like, of course, like, but look what TNA has been doing with them. They had him job to Frankie at the pay-per-view. No reason for that. Remember when Steve Austin was on the come up and he did a bunch of jobs. Yeah, the only person that, that Austin lost to on his come up was 
Brett. <laughs> yeah. Like Brett and or Brett's... Undertaker or Shawn Michaels, but they were like top guys. And look, I think Frankie's a really good wrestler. And, yeah, and I, I think he does a great job. He has really good matches. He shouldn't be losing to Frankie. And everybody's like, no. well, Frankie cheated to win. I was like, okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, and, and they're like, why are you so upset? And I was like, because they got a guy. They have an opportunity here. He he is like, their, he could be their John Cena. It's lower level, of course, because TNA does not have the reach. But he could he really could be like a, a guy for them, like a John Cena, like a Bruno like Cody, like he needs to be the super like over baby face that you keep strong at all times. And when he loses, it means something. And he lost to Frankie Kazarian in the middle of a TNA plus show. And they used the Tito Santana, Macho Man, Randy Savage, 1986 finish where Frankie Kazarian was on the outside of the ropes. He digs into his tights, grabs out the taped, the taped metal object, and he swings at Joe Henry. Henry ducks. He does the big 180. Joe Henry picks him up for a back suplex. And then wham, right in the note. Like, that's the, the same thing that Randy Savage did at Tito Santana. So I, I can respect bringing back the classics, okay? But come on. You're, you guys are killing me. And then he gets eliminated in a minute in front of the biggest audience that he's ever been in front of. Now, look, Joe Henry's over the moon right now. He, he, he thinks the whole thing was great. He has like the most viewed video on WWE's Twitter account since WrestleMania. It's the most viewed Instagram reel. It's it's breaking records. Thankfully, WWE has not, as far as I know, not clipped the elimination and showed that everywhere. They've only shown the entrance. But man, it was that disappointing. I just I honestly don't get it. I don't understand it. We gotta look at this whole thing, right? WWE told their audience that Joe Henry is a joke. Yeah. That's yeah, what they did. They, did. they said this guy is a joke. And you mentioned the the Tito Santana. Randy Savage finish from the night. That's the Intercontinental title match, 1985. Yeah. Who was that finish built to build? Randy. Who was, yeah, that was yeah. finish was to get Randy the title and to define Randy Savage as the champion, right? He was going to be a heel champion for the IC title. This finish, they used the same finish and built Frankie. Like, remember when you talk about Bruno, you know, Bruno did a lot. He fucking won. Yeah, you know, Hulk Hogan did a lot when he was winning. When he was the champ, he fucking won. Yep. Like when you have a top baby face, they win. Like all you've done is just tell people he's not the guy. He's not the guy. He's just a joke. Which I don't understand. I don't understand what you get. And again, you could think like I know Joe and Rich call him a jag, but I mean like for the TNA audience, he's a thing. But TNA guys are used to such bad fucking. I said it. Bad fucking booking for <laughs> decade upon decade. I said it. Then you accept this. Like, this doesn't matter that he lost. Yeah, it's why your company is what it is. Because yeah. of bad fucking booking and because you accept it and you take it and you don't say, hey, this is fucking stupid. And that was fucking stupid. It was it was beyond stupid. Nobody will ever be able to defend it. People have tried because they try to take up for TNA. And they, they come at me in the comments. I had one guy. And this is just one guy. So I don't think this is a complete thing with the, the TNA audience. But I had one guy. Use the line, and I can't believe he said it. He said, "Well, wins and losses don't matter, Mike. You're you're too mad about this." And I'm like, "Bro, okay. Well, then maybe they, he should just keep losing since they don't matter." And and Bound for Glory is very likely going to be in the UK, and Joe Hendry is very likely to be in the main event of Bound for Glory up against Moose. I still think that's the direction because I'll be honest, JD. I don't think they're actively trying to sabotage him. I think they think that's good booking. I think I they think they're building they're building heat for a Hendry or a Hendry Kazarian match coming up at Slammiversary where Hendry's going to overcome the odds and beat Kazarian of all people and then go on to face Moose at Bound for Glory. I think they think that that is good, right? And that's the most disappointing thing because they don't understand that it's bad. They don't. They just don't get it, right? But somebody told me it's like, well, wins and losses don't matter. Okay, well maybe the maybe Kazarian should beat Hendry at Slammiversary and then maybe Hendry should just lose it in the UK since it doesn't matter. You moron. Of course, wins and losses matter. You need your top baby face to be strong. Now, look, not every baby face has to be that way. There are different types of baby faces. Brian Danielson can win and lose. He's he's essentially bulletproof at this point. He's an you know, lots, lots of he's a different kind of character. Joe Hendry is six foot two. He says two hundred fifty two pounds. He's probably two forty, but he's a he's a big guy, muscular guy, and. He very much looks and acts like a John Cena type, a young John Cena type, uh, or, or not young. He's older than John Cena was when John Cena was coming up. But he he could could be that character, 
but they don't want him to be that. Instead, they they keep him as a joke. They're just like they're treating him like he's just another dude. And I th- and I think they're they're blowing it so far. But he is so charismatic. He's such a good promo. He's probably overcoming the bad booking, and he's probably still going to be over anyway. But that's, but the, that's they they don't. It doesn't need to be bad. They can just right. be good. That's the problem. Is like we shouldn't have to have talent overcome bad booking all the time. Yes, we should just book good. You should just book guys well. You should just protect your top baby face. You should just have a guy. Hey, we got a guy. Let's build him. Because who else is the top baby face? Who else do you have? Well, yeah, I, right now, like the top baby face. If you're asking me right now, like who is the biggest star in the company? It's Jeff Hardy. It's just the problem is I just don't think he's allowed to go to Canada. So it's like well, you can't. Well, okay. <laughs> And that's 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 the problem yeah. with Jeff Hardy though is like and I again AEW took a flyer on him WWE took a flyer on him both companies wound up regretting it yeah because he's still Jeff Hardy yeah. and now well, he's a forty eight year old Jeff Hardy is he gonna be over yeah he just he should just do tag stuff with Matt he did not look neither one of them looked good in the ring during their AEW run and he's no. Jeff Hardy Jeff Hardy will walk out there and he'll have people eating out of his hand because there's nobody with Dude, that type of charisma and, and presence. Especially that TNA audience, they love that guy so mm-hmm. much. Like our our buddy Andre, Patreon subscriber, shout out Andre, I was there. That. He he won't admit it, but I get the feeling he cried when he saw Jeff Hardy because he was like six years old the first time he saw Jeff in TNA, and so like it was super important to him. Like Je- Jeff Hardy is awesome. Like he him and Matt are perfect for for TNA. But like yeah, you know you're right. Who else is that? Like they got Josh Alexander. Um, I, I think Mike He's Santana. I know, but Mike, you're right. They have done that. Mike Santana. Maybe. As far as like over guys, guys is getting a reaction from the crowd. He's very much like right up there with with Joe Hendry and uh, and Josh Alexander and those guys. Of course, they got Nick Nemeth. I think they're flipping Steve Macklin babyface, but they tried with Macklin and they failed with him before because they because guess what? Because they, they decided book. not to put him. They they had him lose to Alex Shelley. <laughs> and and what's Alex book. Shelley doing now? That's a great question. What is Alex Shelley? What what the gun's supposed to be going to AEW like three months ago? That's weird. Um. That's the thing. They never, they don't book well. They yeah. don't remember. Remember when they had Josh, when Josh got really hot and they immediately had Moose job, had him job to Moose and they did nothing with it for six months. Well, so, yeah, but it, no, it that up, was, that was I, bad, but, Mike. That was Mike, bad. But I'm telling you, but the rebellion match, the payoff in the end, I, I did like, I did like the rebellion match that they did the following year. Why and did they it have told, to they be, continue to why sell the story? Have but to the, be, why did it have to be six months? Why did Scott Demore have to make the whole thing about him? Why did he make stupid? Why was it? I'm saying okay. I'm not saying you got the result, but why did the booking have to be so bad and nonsensical? I, I think I think you answered your own question. Why Scott did Scott Demore have to make it about himself? Well, that's why Scott Demore is on the unemployment line right now. Okay, fair, but they're still yeah. doing it, and they, it's like they, it's, they are. That's the problem. It's like it doesn't matter. It's almost like it doesn't matter who's there. They shoot themselves in the foot when they get guys over. Like there yeah. was no reason. Why wasn't Josh mad the next fucking day? Why did we wait six months for him to finally get that match with Moose? It, I, I unplugged my headphones. It made <laughs> absolutely no sense at the time. And like in retrospect, yeah, he eventually got it. But we had six months of like nothing with four. It didn't make any sense then. It doesn't make sense now. And Scott's actions made no sense in retrospect. Yeah, None. because because Scott, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was going down, but Scott was like putting obstacles in Josh's way and they're both baby faces. He's like, I'm doing this. This is for your own good. Now, instead of getting moose, you have to wrestle Jonah, which was an awesome match, by the way. The but like, I'm why did it that. happen? <laughs> That's the problem. Remember we kept saying on brace for impact. I kept saying Scott's going heel. Everything Scott's doing makes total sense. If he's protecting moose. And then he did it. That made no sense. <laughs> oh, oh, I my God. That a what, what a time to be alive. Uh, that was a, uh, that- Dude, that was me every week on Brace for Impact was I would try to make sense of that booking and just yell into the microphone when nothing made sense. Yeah, and like three of those guys, well, Artie Evans and Jimmy Jacobs are now in AEW and Will Ospreay is saying that he's got to more in AEW too, so. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. But yeah, I, uh, you know, I I didn't want to go on a long diatribe on TNA tonight because dude TNA dominated our YouTube last week. Good numbers, by the way. But sometimes you gotta go back to what works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let's uh, let's let's get to the let's get to the chat here. I got some uh, got some hazing going on. Um, <laughs> N- N- Nonzo says, Mike, you have fucking dreamer in TNA booking. What did y'all expect? Yeah. Ah, he's right. 
Yeah. Uh, John Mew said a lot of bookers get sold on the idea that it's better to gain through losing. Like it proves something. Sometimes the right answer is to put the person over. So, okay. So that can be true in, in some sense. Uh, it depends on how the person loses. Frankie, Frankie got the victory. Okay. They're probably building to a second match. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with it, but okay. I get it. Okay. If unfortunately right after that match, what they did is they shot an angle to have Kazarian Russell, a steal in Chicago. So it made it look like Ace Steel was the top was the bigger baby face and Ace Steel was the hero and not Joe Hendry. And then you you get to the you get to the the battle royal and what really should have happened, right? If they were if they had their booking minds on, what really should have happened because Joe Hendry should not have won that battle royal. He's not going to go fight the NXT champion. He's not going to do that, right? What should have happened is he should have eliminated Kazarian first. Kazarian's the heel, right? Um and but and then Kazarian sneaks back in later in the match. Whenever you know Hendry's on the final four, Hendry's is distracted. Kazarian sneaks back in and then throws him over. And then now you've just shot an angle for a TNA show that you can connect over on the TNA, right? Like you shot it on NXT. But instead, what they did is Joe Hendry comes out, he trashes everybody in the battle royal, and then the, every, and he gets in. Everybody attacks him like he's the heel. Now Joe Hendry's the heel in this scenario, and then fair and square, Kazarian dumps him out like he's a nobody. Like that's what happened, but instead, like they they could have done a good a good angle, but they chose not to do it. They did a bad one. Wait, did you expect WWE to book someone else's star? Well, you would you would think if they were partners, but uh, no. <laughs> it's like history they, tells me no, that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah maybe somebody should write a write a art, article about that. I think, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I think oh, someone yeah, does sorry. have a Patreon who needs articles. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see transferring. He said, Matt's trying to get him and Jeff back in a WWE already. Yeah. The, look, there's a, there, there, I don't think that WWE is going to take them back unless it's for a hall of fame induction, I agree. which they can do while working for TNA, but they're, they're very much not signing a TNA contract because they want to go back to WWE. Um, every, every, like TNA is like that guy that like every girl that comes into his life doesn't want to be in a relationship. They go on a couple of dates. The next thing you know, that girl's in a relationship. That's the way it always happens with TNA. But look, TNA is a mid-sized company. Like that's kind of, you know, and I think they're, they're a TNA is important to the wrestling business. They feed the ecosystem and it's really important for guys like Matt and Jeff to have a landing spot when they're on the downside of their career. I think it's awesome that they're in TNA and, and they shouldn't sign a contract uh, for more than a couple of years because eventually they're going to want to go back to one of the bigger companies. But I think it's cool that we have a, a TNA where guys on the, uh, the guys that are coming up and guys that are kind of on the downside of the career have a place to go and they can get regular money. I, I think TNA is cool for that stuff. Um, TNA is like a rebound chick, basically. King and said, Mike Santet. I, t- I honestly, King, you're wrong. You're 100 percent wrong. I I know I know people don't like Mike Santana because he left AEW, and that's very that hurts people's feelings. I get that. Um, <laughs> he he wasn't happy in AEW. He, there's too many people at the top of that card. He wasn't going to break through it, so now he's trying somewhere else. He has been very good since he's been in TNA. Uh, he's been a, he's been an impressive guy, and his work. promo his promo work is great. And he's had a uh, they put out a documentary on him. With uh, George Barbosa from the Fight Network, it was really good. Um, he he comes off as just like a legit, like a guy you want to root for. So okay. a- AEW fans, you're all wrong about Santana. Um, like DJ Convoy said, so Mike, when you said Jeff was their biggest star, I laughed. Look, TNA is a small company, and Jeff could be a top star in like a one of the more famous guys in any company right now. He was legitimately the top star in the business like ten years ago or like twelve years ago when he was in WWE. When before he went back, yeah, fifteen. Like he's still he comes in immediately night one he's the most famous guy there. He is 100 percent their biggest star. Like he's Jeff Hardy. Yeah. Like say what you want, he's Jeff Hardy. Yeah, if he goes to MLW, same thing. NWA, same thing. GCW, same right. thing. Anywhere outside of AEW and WWE, he is the biggest star. I I and I don't. I, that's not an indictment on TNA. TNA is a small company. People got to mm-hmm. stop comparing them to AEW and WWE. Mm-hmm. Um, Illa said we got we got Josh and Jonah, but the rest was trash. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, a- absolutely. They just did Kaz and Ace Steel on TV in a in a street fight um, in Chicago. Uh, yeah, uh, Chicago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it was any guy. I haven't watched it yet. I, I haven't actually watched it yet. Um, so ho- hopefully it was good because I got to do a podcast about it later later this weekend. Okay. Oh, you know what? We're we're overtime already, but uh, we'll we'll leave on this. Uh, Shane McMahon to AEW. Shit's gonna be wild. That's I don't not what that's, that's not what that said. That said he was now again because. It's not written very clearly. It sounded like Shane McMahon was calling people up to come back to WWE. I don't know where this whole Shane McMahon to AEW thing comes from. It said he was Conrad. calling guys. 
Yeah, but no, but he said that they, he was calling them to come back to WWE. He didn't say yeah. he was going to AEW. Like, it's yes, really I think Jim Ross said it, he wouldn't be surprised. Like, nothing would surprise him at this point for him to show up in AEW. But I, I, I don't think that's happening. But I did see, like, in a, in a, I, in one of the Voices of Wrestling chats that we're in, and I think I've seen it on Twitter, like, a couple of people, not many people, but there are some people that are kind of, like, talking himself into how, like, that could be interesting. And I'm like, you guys, you're such homers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh anyway guys we we got to get out of here because jd and i have some more recording to do uh we got to go ahead over to the patreon so patreon.com slash the mike and jd show um head over there we're gonna do the who killed wcw we got uh, we got uh, we got some stuff coming out we're gonna record some more content for you also uh check out the jd's uh, kickstarter and uh become a gaijin supporter today everybody support gaijin today we'd greatly appreciate it um j- look just drop a five spot like i did man that's that's an easy way to it's an easy way to help out the book five bucks for an ebook absolutely all right guys that is gonna program. do it for us this time and until next time mahalo uh, 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 uh. competition starting to get thick it's the click so i hope you watch your a game a man no way from the track when we unite and stick this is an a game better bring your a game Competition starting to get thick, it's the click, so I hope you brought your A-game, eight mate, no way. Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the number one show all about the world of Joshi Pro Wrestling. Episodes drop every other Monday where we discuss the biggest Joshi news, review shows, and preview the hottest upcoming Joshi action. So whether you're a new fan or an old fan, we've got something here for you at Jumping Bomb Audio. Check us out on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network.